Um, but we're in John chapter 7, verse 25, and you remember what's been happening. Jesus, uh, going back a couple of Sundays, Jesus' stepbrothers, his half, not his stepbrothers, his half-brothers, his, his brothers, the ones who, his younger siblings that grew up in his house, were telling him, Jesus, you're not doing this right. Your marketing stinks. You need to put some more social media in your marketing budget. You need to get some more billboards. You need to, you know, you need to get out there a little more because all your disciples left. You've got those 12 chuckleheads there that you chose, the fishermen, the religious zealots, the wackos, the nobodies that you have. They are not going anywhere. It's kind of dubious. But all your real disciples are gone. So what do you need to do, Jesus? It's now the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booze. Everybody that's an, an obedient Jewish male is going to be in Jerusalem at that time. So this feast that's now associated with national sovereignty, Mr. Messiah, you need to take advantage of that. And Jesus says, for one thing, it's, it's always that right time. It's always the time to go up for the Feast of Booze. Everybody does that. But this isn't the right time to do what you're asking me to do. This is not the time to foment a rebellion. This is not the time. And there is a time to foment a rebellion. We're not saying that that doesn't ever occur, right? But Jesus says it's not right now the right time. We see him exercising restraint in order to maximize the effectiveness of his gospel ministry at that point. But he does go because he has to. I mean, that's the law which he is keeping perfectly for our sakes. And so he goes up secretly up into the Jerusalem, and in the third day, it says that he goes into the temple and he begins to teach. Because, again, that's one of those things that it's always the right time to do. We talked about that last week, that it's always the right time to take God's Word and apply it to my life today. But, but doing that doesn't shoehorn Jesus into doing something that he has not set the time as being proper to do. So he's teaching, teaching away, and he gets confronted there, right? And, and you remember, we use the term gaslighted. Y'all never heard that term, many of you, before last week. Uh, that, that emotional and mental manipulation that makes really the, the victim, the, the observer here, feel that they have lost grip on reality. He says, if you're so intent on the law, why is it that you don't follow the law? Why are you trying to kill me in this? Ha! <laughs> Jesus, you're a nut job. You're insane. You're out to lunch, Jesus. We're not here to kill you. We just want to hear the Bible. We're not trying to kill you. I don't know who they're talking to here. Jesus has known from way back about the plot to kill him. In fact, that's why he didn't go to Judea. That's why he didn't follow his brother's uh, instructions. Because at that time, that would have short-circuited the intent and the priority of his ministry. Because these people were trying to kill him before the time so that's where we are jesus is still here in the temple this is now the last day of the feast okay this is a very opportune moment and that's why i had ernie read that verse out of your favorite devotional passage leviticus chapter 23 which defines what the feast of booths is right and when it is and what happens and you have to understand that after the Feast of Booze, the Feast of Tabernacles, everybody was camping out in the backyard. They were roasting marshmallows, making s'mores, cooking kosher weenies out there. That's, I mean, seriously, that's, they were having a cookout all week, going to the temple, eating outside, kind of living outside, basically like Isaac, my youngest son. He lives outside most of the day, clean him up on the weekends, bring him to church. At the end of that time, though, everybody was to treat that as like a, a super Sabbath. Everybody was supposed to come into the temple and worship together. Everybody who was already all there in Jerusalem for this Feast of Booths. That's where we are. So some of the people, Jerusalem, were saying, is this not the man whom they're seeking to kill? Now wait a second. Didn't they just deny that? Who's seeking to kill you, Jesus? Nobody's seeking to kill you. You're nuts. But some people in the crowd know this. This is common knowledge. So some of the people in Jerusalem were saying, is this not the, the man whom they're seeking to kill? Look, he's speaking publicly out in the open, and they're saying nothing to him. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? 
However, we know where this man is from, but whenever the Christ may come, no one knows where he is from. And then Jesus cried out in the temple, teaching and saying, You both know me and know where I am from, and I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. I know him because I am from him, and he sent me. So they were seeking to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him because his hour had not yet come. But many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, When the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Therefore Jesus said, For a little while longer I am with you. Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He is not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is this statement that he said, You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So they... They contradict the crowd in the temple at first. This is the guy they're trying to kill. He looks pretty inoffensive to me, doesn't he? And he's speaking publicly. He's not fomenting. You know, you don't foment a rebellion out in public till it's almost past due, right? You, you do that in secret. You do that in the corners, in the back room. This is the guy they're seeking to kill? You ever watch those criminal shows? The, 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 the cop shows? It's kind of depressing. You know, like you wonder how much are they based on reality, right? Whenever they find the bad guys he's carrying a pitchfork, no, he looks pretty normal. He looks like Dilbert, except his tie is usually down, usually. He doesn't look offensive. He doesn't look like that. So they're, they're just wondering, what's the deal here? This guy is just teaching in the temple. We got guys doing that all the time. You say, is this not the man whom they're seeking to kill? Look, he's speaking publicly. They're not saying anything to him. The rulers do not really know that this is the Christ, do they? That's the way of saying they don't know which way is up. They don't know whether he's the Christ or whether he's not the Christ. You know why? Because they're doing nothing. Absolutely nothing. They don't know what they're doing. Ever been there? Ever been to a government meeting of any kind? Any kind, anywhere, elected, appointed, bureaucracy or not, you get that feeling. Technically, I'm an elected official, by the way. Did you know that? Not, not at the church. I'm, I'm a precinct chair. You know how much I know about that? Not a lot. That's all it takes to be a Republican precinct chair in El Paso County. If I were out there telling people how to do it, they could say, I don't know what I'm doing. Maybe I'm being a little facetious. See, what we see, though, there in, in Judea and Jerusalem in this Feast of Booze, this is a time when people are ripe to consider aspects of, of politics, of theology, of doctrine, of all this stuff, coming together to consider being the sovereign people of God on the earth. That, that, that's in their minds right now. And what we see is a leadership vacuum. Right? A, a leadership vacuum entirely. Like they, they have this, they don't like Jesus, they want to kill Jesus, but they're not doing anything at all. And in that midst of that leadership vacuum, and you have to understand it was both political and religious, that was, there, there was none of this separation business. It was all together in the nation of Israel. And in that leadership vacuum, they have basically a consensus. Consensus is not a cuss word in your life, probably. Is it? No, consensus is not necessarily a bad thing. All it means is that we mostly agree. We have a consensus. 
It's a good thing normally to have a consensus. Here's the problem. In a leadership vacuum, you often are susceptible to a false consensus. In a leadership vacuum, you're often subject to a false consensus. That's what's happened here. Maybe you missed that. See, in, in, in this situation, the leaders of Israel, the leaders of the Jews, had the responsibility to do one of two things, to either convince the people of the truth of who Jesus is and what he's teaching, or to confront Jesus in the error of what he was teaching and who he claimed to be. None of this man be pan be do nothing business. There's a leadership vacuum, and in the midst of that leadership vacuum where they're doing nothing, the consensus that they reached was, in fact, initially at least, a falsehood. It was. By the way, consensus also isn't necessarily a positive thing either. See, in my world, consensus might be a little bit of a cuss word. We have this thing called consensus doctrine. And that's where people say, you're a minority, so you're wrong. Happens to me a lot, actually. You're a minority, so you're wrong. You know, they don't agree with you. They don't agree with you. They don't agree with you. I'm like, well, then I'm pretty unsure footing then. Those are a bunch of liberals and whack jobs. Liberal as far as doctrine goes. But people don't see it that way. They have an erroneous consensus here. Uh, General Patton uh, said that if everybody is thinking alike, somebody's not thinking. You could apply that one all over, couldn't you? If everybody's thinking alike, somebody's not thinking. See, they reached a false consensus, and here's what it is. Verse 27, however, we know where this man is from. In other words, we know Jesus. He's Jesus of Nazareth. He's of Galilee. He's the presumed son of, the, the son of Joseph, son of Mary. We know his lineage. We know he's a hillbilly. Sounds like one, smells like one, is one. But when the Christ comes, we won't know, no one knows where he is from. Is that true? Wasn't true at all. It wasn't true by a long shot. But in a leadership vacuum, that's what you get. You get some uninformed false consensus, and that becomes the rule of the day. Because everybody, everybody assumes that that's true. That was perpetuated. And you need to understand that bad doctrine is perpetuated by a false consensus. And that is a story that has been repeated over and over and over in the history of the church again and again and again and again. And then there are doofuses like me that feel like bucking it. And they say, well, everybody says you're wrong. Have I said I don't care enough over the last few weeks? I do not care if the weight of thousands of years of consensus based on bad understanding of the Bible tells me I'm wrong. I don't care. All right, so don't, don't tell me that. Tell me Bible if you want to disagree with me. Y'all don't disagree with me a lot. It's okay. But if you do, bring Bible because I'll have mine. All right. It's entirely incorrect, isn't it? We won't know where he's from. We'll, no, we know all sorts of stuff about where Jesus was supposed to come from. Right? He spoke of the tribe of Judah, son of David. David's heir. He's supposed to be from the city of David, Bethlehem. Born there. All sorts of things. But you know what it did? And this is what bad doctrine does sometimes too. It relieves people of proper responsibility. So when they reached this false consensus about a bad doctrine, it relieved them of a responsibility. What, their responsibility, what were they supposed to be doing all these years, all these generations, from the very time that God prophesied that there would be a Messiah way back in Genesis 3, what were they supposed to be looking for? The Messiah. They were supposed to be looking for Emmanuel, God with us. They were supposed to be looking for this man, Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, they knew exactly where he was going to come from, and they had a pretty good idea when he was coming. But with this bad consensus, they could say, no, nah, well, it'll, be, it'll be unmistakable, and we don't have to worry about it. We don't have to exercise our brains about, <laughs> about who's what and where. Doesn't that, doesn't that open the door to some really crazy stuff? 
if you're not supposed to know where the Messiah is from? I mean, I've told you about the half a dozen Jesuses running around in New Mexico, right? And I'm not talking about the people working in the yards necessarily either. People who set them up and say, I am Jesus incarnate. In fact, there's a Chinese cult that is sweeping across the Philippines right now that believes that Jesus came back as a little Chinese woman. And they're serious. I'm not kidding. I forget what the thing is called, the church of the guiding eternal light or whatever. Sweeping across the Philippines for people that don't know where the Messiah is supposed to come from or where he's going to come from again. That's the only way that's possible. To get from Jesus is coming back the same way he left to Jesus came back already as a little Chinese woman. Like, y'all think I'm joking. I know you are, but I'm not joking. But it relieved them of that responsibility. People flocked to a consensus of doctrine like that. They're they just, where things become passive for them. So leadership vacuum leads to false consensus. False consensus breeds false doctrine. But in the midst of that, truth sounds like lunacy. Truth sounds like lunacy in the middle of a false consensus. Then Jesus cried out in the temple. You thought yelling in church was bad. Ha! Ha ha! Jesus cried out in the temple in the middle of corporate worship. He, he dons the veil of an Old Testament prophet and he cries out to the people and says, Look, yes, you know who I am. You know where I'm from. You know all this about me. But you don't know the Father. Because if you knew all that about me and you knew the Father, you would know who I am and why I'm here. That's what he says. You both know me and know where I'm from. I have not come of myself, but he who sent me is true, whom you do not know. That was very offensive to say to a Jewish person. You, you're the chosen people of God, but you have no clue who he is. You don't have an intimate knowledge of the Father that placed his name upon you. You're no better off in your knowledge than the Greeks that they disparage later. Truth sounds like lunacy in the middle of a consensus lie. They were supposed to be expecting him. You know who I am? You know where I'm from? I validated myself by not seeking my own glory, but by seeking the glory of the Father who sent me. I'm true by my own definition. See, they, what they presumed backwards. They presumed that they knew God the Father, and thus they would recognize the Messiah, even though they, they thought they shouldn't know where he was from. And in fact, they needed to observe who Jesus was, believe in him, so that they would know the Father in ways that they did not know him previously. That's the way that was supposed to work. In fact, that's the whole point of the incarnation, in case you missed the point of the incarnation. It was so that you could see the Father, so that you could observe him in ways that was not known before. He tells them, if you reject me, you're demonstrating that you do not have any intimate knowledge of your God. I know him. No one knows him but me. I know him. He sent me. That's where the authority comes for Jesus to stand in the temple with the mantle of the prophet crying out. See, I grew up in Bible churches. There's a lot of muttering in Bible churches. It reminds me of how the synagogues in the tome must have been. considered impolite to speak clearly and loudly. And if I were to speak like I was speaking now, who gives you the right to speak at us like that? I didn't know I needed permission. It was just me. You're speaking God's word to people. If you can't do it loudly and clearly, you need to study some more. Jesus is pretty clear on what he's doing. Intimate knowledge of the Father. He has a commission from the Father. 
So consensus, false consensus, has the opportunity to build in a leadership vacuum. When the leadership fails to convince people of the truth or confront error, that creates a leadership vacuum. Consensus over false doctrine tends to build in that environment. That environment is allowed to fester. <laughs> truth sounds like lunacy. This is repeated over and over and over, by the way. You, you can study church history and see this happen repeatedly. But even with the appearance of lunacy, obedience provides protection from the Father. Verse 30 says to this, so they were seeking to seize him. They wanted to. They wanted to drag him off. They wanted to take him out of there. Again, this is not a leadership responsibility. They're just trying to disappear the guy, you know. They're just trying to make it go away. They're seeking to seize him. And no man laid his hand on him because his hour had not yet come. How did that look? Like literally, were they like, hey, Weston, Whoa. Was there a force field? I don't know. Did it zap them like Star Wars? I don't know. They were seeking to seize him. They were seeking to lay their hands on him, but no one could lay a finger on him because it wasn't the right time. I don't, there's interesting things like that. You don't know. Were they, were they literally trying to break through this divine force field? Could they see it? Could they feel it? Could they touch it? I don't know. They were trying to seize him, and no man laid his hand on him because his hour had not yet come. But many of the crowd believed in him, and they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? See, Jesus was obedient. He, re he recognized when it was, what, it, what was the right time to do, to go into the temple to teach to preach. In fact, it was very clear he cried out and was teaching at the same time. Don't tell me that those are two different things. Cried out and was teaching. Confronted the truth. Obedient to the thing for which it was the right time. And that provided protection for him. No one could lay a finger on him. See, obedience provides protection from the power of a false consensus. And that's, that's what we're seeing right here. The crowd had made certain presumptions about Jesus. Jesus taught the truth, and they were not able to lay a finger on him. And the result was that many believed. Remember that? Restraint is necessary to maximize our ministry effectiveness. Jesus is right there in the thick of it. He's not fomenting a political rebellion. He's teaching about himself, the truth about himself. People are trying to seize him. It is a craziness in the temple at that moment. Every single able-bodied, healthy Jewish male that was able to be there in that temple was there at this point, at least in near proximity. Continues on, continues on, being obedient what the Lord has given, God has given him to do. Many believed. So then the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering. I wonder if that was the Pharisees imprinting what they thought was going on. But John says it, so they were muttering these things about him. By the way, muttering doesn't mean they didn't believe it. It just meant they were a little scared. They were muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. That's not going to work, right? It's not the right time, but they keep doing it. See, that's the definition of insanity that we work on, right? Keep doing the same things over and over, expecting different results. <laughs> Jesus is the one who appears crazy, though, to them in the middle of their consensus. Therefore, Jesus said, a little while longer, I'm with you. I'm with you. Who's he saying that to? Pharisees. The crowd. What would you and I say? Somebody sent them people to arrest me. Which, 
could happen in my lifetime. I don't expect it today. It happens all over the world, every day. People locked in secret prisons every day in this world for preaching the word of God, never to be seen again. What would you and I say? For a little bit while, I'm going to oppose you, you stinking Pharisees. For a little while longer, you're going to have the opportunity to oppose me. He doesn't say that. He says, guys, for a little while longer, I am with you. I'm not against you. I'm with you. I have this ministry to you at this time for just a little while longer, and then the opportunity is going to be gone. This unique opportunity that you have right now. You will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. I don't take that as a statement of their eternal destiny, by the way. Because he says that same thing to his followers, his children. He says, little children, where I, as I told the Jews, where I'm going, you cannot come. Meaning, at that time, there are no other humans going with Jesus <laughs> where he's going. That's not eternal destiny. It's, it's a, a time limitation on the opportunities that Jesus' physical presence provided them in his ministry. Where I'm going, you cannot come. So you'll lose this opportunity. There may be others. But this opportunity only has a time limit on it. The Jews then said to one another, the Jews, you remember, code word, unbelievers, the Jews. Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? They're, they have pretty high estimation of their skill. Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He is not intending to go, <gasps> yes, to the Greeks, to the dispersion, to the Gentiles, I mean, he's crazy, but let's be honest, let's, he's not that crazy. <laughs> he wouldn't go to the nation. It's kind of a foreshadowing of where the gospel is intended to go, isn't it? Again, the unbelievers are incredulous at the extent to which Jesus' ministry is possible. What is this statement that he said, you will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? They don't understand his words. All they can do is repeat it back to him. They do a pretty good job, actually. They actually repeated the real words that Jesus said. Most of the time when you have people going around quoting Jesus that don't believe in him, they get it wrong. They'll change something, forget something, leave something out that's critical to understand the passage. Belief seeks understanding, folks. It doesn't go the other way around necessarily. Understanding, seeking to believe is a little bit short-sighted. All they can do is repeat the statement over and over and over. But again, finally, on this very last day, everybody actually in the Sabbath, in the worship, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out again, taking the mantle of his prophet, crying out, saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. What's he talking about when he says water? Drink the water. Y'all remember? Believe in me. Receive eternal life. He's talking to unbelievers. Bread is bread. Is bread. Water is water. Water is not bread. Bread is not water. Come to me. If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And he clarifies that. He means he who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow fountains or rivers of living water. Not today, but it's guaranteed, he said. I mean, that, John clarifies. The spirit had not yet been given, but that's a seal. That's a guarantee. It's a promise. On this super Sabbath, that's what he chooses to say. I wasn't able to attend our Ted Cruz rally yesterday. I like Ted Cruz. I'll be honest, I voted for Ted Cruz every time I got an opportunity to vote for Ted Cruz. Now don't turn me into the IRS. I didn't say if you're a member of El Paso Bible Church, you'll vote for Ted Cruz. I did not say that. Now did I? But I said what I did. 
You all know I still have the First Amendment, right? I can say what I want to say. Jesus had every opportunity to turn that into a political rally, didn't he? He probably could have even sold tickets. <laughs> thought he could have used it as a fundraiser for his political aspirations if he had them, if he needed them. You know, Jesus doesn't need political aspirations. He has political prophecy. <laughs> it's a little bit different. That's why people in America have political aspirations because they still got to get voted in. You don't vote on Jesus. Now, Jesus has prophecy. He has a promise. He's coming. He's already got the position. He doesn't need you to vote for him. He doesn't need you really to help him. He's just going to come. He's going to bring his kingdom. Your choice is what to do in light of that today, yourself. The Super Sabbath, for a politician, that would be a great opportunity to pursue his platform. But what does Jesus do? He cries out again as a prophet. He says, believe in me and live and from you life will flow he who believes in me we can go back to John 4 he will never thirst again Lord give us this water is what the Samaritan woman said give me this water give me this water I, I don't want to keep carrying water around give me this water I want to live he never mixes the two metaphors. And the scripture will make a lot more sense to you if you don't mix the metaphors. Bread is bread, water is water. Bread is not water, water is not bread. Believe and receive life. The greatest opportunity we've seen him have, the greatest audience that he has ever had, the most attentive audience that he has ever had in his ministry to this point in the Gospel of John. And what does he do? preaches the clear, simple gospel of God's grace. You can't afford to have a leadership vacuum, folks. You can't afford that in your family. You can't afford it in the church. You can't afford it in any context in which we have. But we need to understand that godly leadership keeps the gospel as job number one. No matter what the other circumstances are, no matter what the other people's assertions are about it, no matter how many pastors' meetings you go to and people say you are off your rocker for making it that simple and that easy and that sweet and that gracious and you need to talk about God's wrath anymore, some more. Do you need to talk about God's wrath more? Here's what, here's what you need to say in relation to God's wrath. Propitiation. Monichel said, propitiation, propitiation. Do you know what that word means? Now that I've told you, you need to say it. Over. It means that God's wrath is satisfied. You know what John says later in one of his epistles about God's wrath and propitiation? He says that Jesus Christ is our propitiation, and not ours only, but for the whole world. 1 John 2, 2. So when somebody tells you you need to talk about God's wrath more, you could turn in the dictionary for him. Oh, ooh, let me Google that for you. You like that? <laughs> I don't know if anybody does that. Anymore. Let me Google propitiation for you and give it to him. Say, so that's all that the Bible says about God's wrath now. Preach the words of life. That's what Jesus did. Jesus was not yet glorified, but he is now. Praise the Lord. We have the Spirit with us. The events that allowed that to take place are the ones that we're remembering this morning as we remember his death for us. The bread symbolizing his body. The, I almost said wine. My liturgical part of me is coming out. The juice, it's juice, folks. It's not even old enough yet to be wine. It's pasteurized even. Juice represents his blood that he gave for us. And we remember his death until he comes. That's what Paul says. 